Across America, it's clear that prescription drug misuse and abuse has become an urgent and growing public health crisis, impacting the lives of Americans in every state and from every background, all too often with deadly results. This film represents a key part of our work to raise awareness about the magnitude of this problem and its terrible results so we can prevent the ravages of addiction and the suffering and dysfunction that follow. Effective solutions to contain this epidemic will require our best collaborative efforts. Aloha and good morning, Honolulu. Welcome to another gorgeous day in paradise. Mahalo for joining us on this beautiful Hawaiian morning. Waikiki surf is two to three. Temperature, it's a lovely 76 degrees. If you caught our top local news story, a Honolulu teenager died last night, apparently a result of prescription drug overdose. We're seeing more of this across the US. More than 119 people die every day from accidental death due to drug poisoning. That's more than auto accidents on highways, more than cocaine and heroin overdoses put together. This is now the number one cause of accidental death in America. In fact, the nation's Centers for Disease Control says this is an epidemic and is taking the lives of school kids to teens, young adults, baby boomers, elders, prescription drug poisoning. We're seeing a major public health crisis across the nation and Hawaii is no exception. It may even be happening in your own home. We're sending out our condolences to the family. right across the street from Kailua Beach. Two loving parents. Our family was really close. We had dinners together every night. My mom was a kindergarten school teacher and my dad was a banker. I was on the soccer team. I played baseball. I kayaked and paddled. I felt like I wanted to fit in. I wanted to hang out with the popular kids. I started going out, started drinking. A lot of kids my age from normal backgrounds, really good upbringings, were getting caught up in this Oxycontin thing. On the east side in Kailua, it was really big. I didn't think it was that bad because it was legal. It was prescribed by a doctor. Like, I did not see how this was gonna affect me later on in life at all. What does a pharmaceutical abuser look like? The pharmaceutical abuser looks like you or me. He has, initially has a job. It can be from high school 
to 70 years old. In the younger abuser, what we see is that they're stealing their meds from mom or dad or trading at school and getting it from friends. Uh, they're trying all kinds of different drugs. That's a real danger to us because they don't know what these drugs do. They hear about it on the internet. They think, how can it be dangerous? A doctor prescribes it. Internet shows only the good side of the high. They don't show you the kid going into respiratory arrest. Only a few countries have developed the problems that we have with a huge increase in unintentional deaths and a lot of diversion, a lot of substance abuse. It's seen everywhere on the street and it's very difficult to control. Canada has as big a problem as the United States. Australia has a big problem. Some communities in parts of Europe the United Kingdom, Germany. The Senate Caucus on International Narcotics Control held a hearing Wednesday on heroin and prescription drug abuse. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss what is perhaps the most important public health issue facing the United States, namely the abuse of opioid drugs, including prescription painkillers and heroin. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, drug overdose deaths primarily driven by prescription opioids now surpass homicides and traffic crashes in the number of injury deaths in America. Opioid medications are the most effective interventions we currently have. We face the unique challenge of preventing their abuse while safeguarding their value for managing severe pain, which, if untreated, is terribly debilitating. It is estimated that 2.1 million Americans are addicted to opioid painkillers, which reflect the widespread availability of these drugs. Heroin abuse currently affects more than half a million Americans, driven in part by individuals switching from prescription opioids to heroin because it is cheaper and easier to access. So pain relievers like oxycodone and hydrocodone affect the central nervous system in much the same way as heroin. In fact, four out of five heroin users today started with prescription drugs. So how did we so quickly and unknowingly get to where we are? Actually, it didn't all take place overnight. Very early humans observed animals ingesting plants, earth decomposed and fermented materials. Archaeological sites and mummified human remains show traces of medicinal herbs used 60,000 years ago. We have been using ceremonial and medicinal herbal compounds for thousands of years to relieve our pain and discomfort and to alter our human consciousness. Up until the 1800s, medicine was a frightening combination of folk remedies, popular witchcraft, religious beliefs, and luck. Doctors of the day might have recommended a change of air, vomiting, laxatives. Preparations would have included lethal elements like mercury, arsenic, and strychnine. The Industrial Revolution and the invention of the steam engine brought an expansion of American cities and overcrowding, poverty, and poor sanitation. Outbreaks of smallpox, typhus, tuberculosis, and cholera inspired the development of modern medicine that changed and improved the quality of life for those who were lucky enough to have access to the new compounds being discovered. Opiates were typically a key ingredient in patent medicines. Morphine was given by injection for battle injuries and it was so effective that the soldiers kept taking it and they became addicted in huge numbers. Morphine addiction was called then the soldier's illness. A national campaign sparked by fears over sanitation and adulteration in industrial food production, including concerns over the unlisted ingredients in patent medicines, led to the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906. By the 20th century, the application of scientific methodology and advances in pharmacology and surgery revolutionized medicine. Synthetic chemicals were developed to create vaccines, anesthesia, pain relief, and other pharmaceutical wonders. Then the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act of 1914 was created to tax and control production, importation, and distribution of drugs derived from poppies and coca leaves, namely opioids and cocaine. America was forever changed. By the time the harmful effects of drugs like cocaine and opium were realized, people had already begun relying on these drugs and using them recreationally. World War II brought the pharmaceutical industry and the government together to develop new drugs for soldiers in modern warfare. The drugs of choice 
are the barbiturates. You will note that in combat exhaustion, massive doses of these drugs are needed in therapy. Germany and Japan had been at the cutting edge of pharmaceutical development. Drugs became crucial in the waging of war. Substances like amphetamines chemically empowered troops in the field. The Nazi soldiers, Japan's kamikaze, British and American pilots on bombing missions. Along with U.S. government investment in drug production for warfare, the defeat of their primary economic competitors left the United States with strategic advantage in the pharmaceutical industry on a global scale. War spurred mass drug production and also contributed to the already growing popularity and acceptance of many drugs, including painkillers and a growing new array of synthetic compounds. By the 1960s, the general use of these drugs saturated popular culture and were widely available and advertised. As drug production and consumption exploded, the list of controlled substances continued to grow. But what was not fully understood was that as the pharmaceutical industry developed new medically beneficial drugs, not enough attention was paid to their destructive potential. This was a prescription for abuse, and we're living it today. Dr. Harold Spear of Hanapepe Clinic on Kauai pleaded guilty to five federal charges related to distribution of illegal narcotics. Spear prescribed oxycodone and methadone over the phone without physical exams. He also conducted business from a website called dialadoc.net. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Oliveira made it in his sleep after drinking a concoction called Crunk, a drink that mixes soda or other beverage with an over-the-counter cough syrup and crushed prescription painkillers proven dangerous and deadly. I know that given recent media attention to overdose deaths, there is a heightened public interest in the threat of opioid drug use. While this might be a new phenomenon for many of our communities, some have been dealing with this issue for a very long time, and it's a matter of great concern for this administration. According to our national survey, 54% of those who obtained pain relievers for non-medical use in the past year received them from a friend or relative for free. Another 14.9% either bought them or took them from a friend or relative. Thus, we have both a public health problem intertwined with the cultural problem. It is clear that we can't arrest our way out of the drug problem. Science has shown us that drug addiction is a disease of the brain, a disease that can be prevented, treated, and from which one can recover. What are pharmaceutical drugs? Pharmaceutical drugs are medications available only with a prescription from a doctor. Today's most commonly abused pharmaceuticals fall into three categories. Painkillers and opioids, benzodiazepines and barbiturates, and stimulants. Painkillers and opioids are narcotic analgesics meant to dull the senses, bring about deep sleep, and reduce pain. Like heroin, opioid painkillers are made from opium, and the, the effects they produce in the brain are indistinguishable from heroin. The number of yearly prescriptions for opioids more than doubled over the past 20 years to 207 million prescriptions a year, while at the same time there was a fourfold increase in overdose deaths from these medications. These are also important medications for end-of-life care and when used to treat pain on a short-term basis. But these non-controversial uses, cancer care or short-term use for acute pain, account for a small portion of our overall consumption. The United States has a little over 4% of the world's population, but over 80% of the world's prescription narcotic pain medications are prescribed in the United States. Fort Street Mall would be the location where you can procure a lot of different pharmaceutical drugs. Xanax to oxycodones, uh, morphine, somas, trazodones. Uh, I've been using one drug or another since I was 14. Basically, the last 20 years, I've been in a coma. My direction in life was clouded continually by the use of mostly prescription medications. Opiates, uh, oxycontin, oxycodone, sedatives, Valium, uh, Xanax. It progressed to 100 milligrams a day. 
you know. I've held jobs, but I've also lost jobs, and I've lost friends, and my family, they, they knew. We have drugs like fentanyl, 100 times stronger than morphine. Pharmaceutical drugs that are much cleaner than heroin. Street addicts know that if I can get a drug like OxyContin, if I can get a drug like Dilaudid, that's better than heroin. As they progress in their abuse and they can't get those drugs, we see them drop to the heroin and the other street drugs. But the pharmaceutical drugs, that's gold to them. We are having an emerging situation with all of these synthetic opiates, the oxycodone, the oxycontin, the Vicodin. And it's something that is maybe one of the more difficult drugs to stop using once you've had it. I have seen professional people, I have seen lawyers start out with a back injury getting addicted to the synthetic opiates. But through programs like HOPE, working with our good treatment programs, people can stop using. Someone who's on the outside looking in might say, what's wrong with you? You're a physician. You're a smart guy. How could you take these medications? But for me, taking pills was something that was completely normal. When I was a little kid, that's what my parents did. If there was a, a malady, an ailment, physical, emotional, they took pills myself and for a, a number of other physicians that I know, access is, is really easy. It's essentially a, a uh, signature away. My drug of choice is Vicodin. I took two a day, but two became seven. Seven went to more. And it got to the point where it was difficult to get as many as I needed to satisfy my, my habit. I was going to multiple places and pharmacies and um, and even that didn't stop me. When I was in my addiction, my world was so self-centered. I was putting the use, the acquisition of drugs before everything else, before my family, my career, my child. It's insidious. I ruined relationships with my family. I had a lot of broken promises. Every moral and value that I was raised with, and I was instilled with good ones from my parents. My parents are really good people, and everything went out the window. I was concentrated on being able to get that pill, doing that pill, and nothing else mattered whatsoever. I called my neurosurgeon and said, I need to make an appointment um, with you. And by the way, uh, uh, I need 280 milligrams worth of OxyContin and 10 Norco. If I can't get an appointment until November. And the nurse laughed at me. She said, well, what are you on? And how much are you taking? And with that, a lot opened up in my mind. I injured my right shoulder at work and I went to the doctor for the pain. I was prescribed Percocet. As it gradually went on and on, I noticed that, oh, you need two in the morning. You need three in the morning to get your day started. About six months into it, the pain was not there anymore. But I still went to the doctor. What is your pain level? And I would always say nine. And right away the prescription was written. And this went on and on and on. I mean, it went on for three years. Never in my imagination would I th thought that I would actually be dependent on something. I was the PTA mom, the mom that coached soccer, coached baseball, volleyball. I worked 40 hours a week and still did everything at home with as far as dinners, laundry, pool, yard, cars. And then before I knew it, I was taking six to eight 80 milligram OxyContins a day, for all prescribed by the doctor. And so my story was that if the doctor prescribed it, it was okay to take. People told me I had a problem, but I didn't want to listen. I didn't think I had a problem. I was still taking care of my house, still taking care of my husband, still taking care of my children. I thought, in my mind. By the seventh month, my, my teeth in the back of my head were falling out, cracking and falling out. Um, I was just sick all the time. I, I wasn't driving because I did strange things. I left my car out in front of my office one day, running in the middle of the street. We went to the pharmacy. We picked up um, needles 
We just asked for them. They sold them to us. We went back to my friend's house and um, followed the directions that I learned on the internet. I was injecting 10 80 milligram oxys a day. And that was normal place for um, the friends that I was hanging out with. These are kids that come from really good families that have every opportunity in the world. What has happened to me? And is this why I'm so sick? Is this why uh, I can't work? Is this why I'm completely dysfunctional? You know, take one before I took the kids to school. And then I'd take another one, then I'd take a nap, then I'd go pick them up from school, and then I'd usually take two because I had to make dinner and, you know, get... I mean, it drives your whole entire life. Some of the kids that I started out using with grew out of it. They ended up stopping and they have families and they're successful. Um, then there's another group of us that ended up in and out of treatment centers. This is my third treatment center. Um, most of my, my friends are incarcerated. They're locked up. They're in, they're in um, Halaba or in the mainland. There was a notion back in the 70s and 80s that pain was being undertreated and there needed to be a greater awareness. So the idea of a fifth vital sign uh, was presented by one of the pain societies. We know about heart rate and blood pressure, uh, about temperature and respiration. Those are the classic four vital signs. And the fifth became your pain levels. A paper was published in the late 80s that became very influential that said patients with cancer who were treated with narcotic medication, uh, they didn't get uh, addicted to these medicines and the medicines remained effective. And this model from cancer treatment was then transferred and uh, adopted by doctors treating non-cancer pain. And this is the problem that we now uh, face. We didn't do this out of malicious intent. For most of us, it was a desire to treat pain more compassionately that led to overprescribing. We were responding to a campaign that encouraged long-term use. The risks were minimized, especially the risk of addiction, and benefits were exaggerated. We are medicating more than we ever were because we have more medications to use now. So we are medicating more. And physicians, and healthcare providers, and medical systems, including the VA, are a part of that. If a patient uh, felt that uh, they needed more opioid, that it was safe to give it as long as they hurt, and as long as they were still uh, experiencing considerable amount of pain, that, uh, that it would be reasonable to continue to escalate their dose. I would not do that now. Um, I think that we need to look at their function, their mental clarity, um, and at some point, um, they're, they're enough is enough, uh, and, and it's not just more is better. Stimulants are used to treat obesity, narcolepsy, sinus and bronchial congestion, and attention deficit and hyperactivity disorders, ADHD and ADD, in children as young as four years old. The number of prescriptions written for these kinds of stimulants has skyrocketed in the past two decades, as have reports of abuse, addiction, and overdose. You know that Adderall is basically D-methamphetamine, so there's just a different chemical makeup of the regular methamphetamine that's on the street. Street methamphetamine is a stimulant, meaning uh, it causes an increase in heart rate and blood pressure. People who have bad hearts who may not know it can uh, have their heart disease unmasked by um, stimulants. So it's um, not unheard of that the first time an adult does a stimulant, they actually can die from it. We have a problem with Adderall in this country. It's an, it's an epidemic. Uh, there were people in rehab there specifically for Adderall. Yeah, Adderall's highly addictive. It's methamphetamine. Sometimes the parents seek management. That, by the way, I think is one of the reasons why this medication has been overprescribed to begin with. We are a culture where we want a simple fix for complex problems. Parents will do anything, often will go to great lengths to increase the competitive advantage of their, of their children. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a place. I have seen many cases carefully diagnosed and monitored where there is clear benefit of Adderall. 
Often taken in a dangerous mix of alcohol or with other drugs, benzodiazepines like Valium, Xanax, and Clonopin are the most frequently abused prescription medications leading to death by poisoning. Half or more of opioid-dependent patients are also dependent on prescription benzodiazepines. These patients get anxious when they're on high doses of opioids because they're always worried about getting their dose. And so they get prescribed something for anxiety, which they kind of like, the benzodiazepine, and that potentiates the opioid and makes it much more dangerous. Uh, an overdose makes it easier to overdose. Barbiturates, depressants, reds, blues, rainbows, were made popular in the early 1960s. Used recreationally and often mixed with alcohol, many accidental deaths were attributed to this lethal combination. Secondol and Tuanol are sedative hypnotics and central nervous system depressants. They slow normal activity and affect vital parts of our bodies. They're prescribed for anxiety, panic attacks, sleeplessness, and stress. But sudden withdrawal can be fatal. New controversial drugs called Z or sleep drugs include Ambien and Lunesta. They induce sleep, but for some users, they have also demonstrated a potential for dependence, strange behavior, accidents, and polypharmaceutical deaths. My husband commanded a submarine, was in charge of a billion dollar piece of equipment. He was a very normal guy. No addiction problems, no drinking, no smoking, no anything. After he retired, he started taking Ambien. And we questioned the doctor about this because it had been going on for a few months. And the doctor said, no, it's fine. You can continue taking it. And he trusted him. One morning, I woke up. And normally, my husband would be in his office, and he wasn't in there. And so I went around the neighborhood and looked to see if he was running. And I let the dogs out and one of them ran directly to the pool and started barking. So I walked out to the pool and I saw him floating and jumped in and tried to pull him out. He was on Ambien and he slept, walked into the pool and drowned. He was 45 years old. During the time this doctor was prescribing, the FDA came out with a long list of warnings about this drug. Call it the zombie drug because it's like a hypnotic and people don't realize what they're doing when they're on it. The association, behavioral changes, sleepwalking, sleep eating, sleep driving, people having sex, not remembering it, like they're hypnotized. He was on it for nine months, and that's way longer, so the doctor was prescribing it off-label. It just completely ruined my life and my son's life. He, he's dead, and when the paramedics showed up, my son said, um, They'll be able to bring him back, right, Mom? <sighs> About one in five of our adolescents in any given year have a prescription, a legal prescription for one of these controlled medications. That's really high, that's one in five. And with the Z drugs like sleepers, Ambien and Lunesta, 44% will engage in medical misuse with their own medication in that given year. For reasons that we don't fully understand, we have a desire to have novel experiences. And that does something to us in a positive and, and pleasurable way. Some of these novel experiences can be really good, and we repeat them, whether it's jumping out of an airplane with a parachute or diving. Many, many, many things. But other novel experiences can have serious bad effects, and we need to know what's a safe novel experience and what is a very dangerous novel experience and what is a pathway not to even start on because you're going to have trouble getting off of that pathway. What happens in our brain? When we do something pleasurable, 
The feelings we get are influenced by a network of neurons called the reward pathway. The prescription medicines being misused imitate the effects of the brain's neurotransmitters in this reward pathway. They artificially produce and prolong pleasurable sensations. They imitate the brain's dopamine, endorphin, and serotonin production and the function of the reward pathway. Opioids, benzodiazepines, amphetamines, and relaxants are imposters, more powerful than the body's own neurotransmitters. Since humans are pleasure-seeking organisms, the desire to misuse and abuse these powerful prescription medicines interferes with the brain's natural reward pathways and the potential for the cycle of abuse, dependency, and often fatal consequences of addiction or poisoning may occur. Addiction, it completely drives your life. That drug, you get up in the morning and you think, okay, I have six Oxycontin. How and when am I gonna take them? In the beginning, when Jenny showed signs of overdosing on medication, I was very reluctant to uh, address it, and I was in denial. But as it went on, I realized that she was in serious trouble. I love my daughter very much, and I knew that there was good inside of her, and I knew that I couldn't abandon her, that I had to stick with her and help her as much as I could. My coping skill was going out, getting oxys, and then I wouldn't have to deal with the world. I didn't have to worry about what I was going to do in the future. I didn't have to live up to anything. Yeah. Through medical school residency, my lifestyle didn't seem abnormal. It seemed something that was, and with the people I hung out with, it was the norm. So to take these medications for recreational use didn't seem like it was that big of an issue to me. Because of how many oxys I was doing, um, I wasn't getting the same effect that I was when I began. I was dependent on, on the pills. I, if I didn't have them, I'd get sick. I'd get really, really sick. You know, the addict is a master of deception. All addicts are, even in rehab. The first thing I do when I talk to kids is I ask them, how many of you have heard of a pharmaceutical drug? How many drugs you know? And the kids scream out, Vicodin, Xanax, Adderall. And I ask them, where do you learn about this? They go, well, friend, my friends use, I see it on the internet, I see it on TV, I hear it in rap music. And they tell me, it's all over the place. What's the big deal? It's prescribed by a doctor, it's not dangerous. Kids were being admitted into the emergency room just because they were taking unknown prescription drugs. Then you would have accidental overdoses. What we started to see is an uptick in what they call farm parties, where the admission to the event is actually prescription drugs. So teenagers go into their parents or their family's medicine cabinets, they dump out the pills, not even knowing what they are, and they take them. And even more unfortunate than that, because you don't know exactly what you're taking, is they often wash it down with alcohol. So we saw a lot of emergency room admissions. What kind of parties are they having? They're called raves. They're called uh, farm parties. Their drugs of choice is pills and alcohol mixed together, very deadly. The 19-year-old is the only adult that was there. Everybody else was, was all under 18. They were drinking vodka and doing these pills. So I met with this 19-year-old's girlfriend. She said, he got the pills from my cousin. Uh, my cousin got the pills from her father's friend's house. Uh, when they went there, she went into the cabinet and took his pills, but uh, we found out that the girl who bought the pills to this party was only 12. We can't do anything to bring him back. He made a bad choice, and that one bad choice is what led to his death. I worked as an undercover officer in the vice section. I've been with the, the police department, federal law enforcement agencies, task forces. I've got, I, I think, extensive knowledge in common drugs, marijuana, cocaine, ice, heroin. But prescription drugs, 
I had no knowledge. Three years ago, my friend called me up. He just got out of work. And he's like, I don't know how to tell you this. Your son, he's an uh, unresponsive male. They partied all night. Um, they did a cocktail of prescription drugs. I would buy NyQuil, and we buy two bottles, and he's all oh, Dad, I have a cold. You know, and that's one of the things they use NyQuil with sodas, and they mix them with the pills. I didn't see the signs. I, I couldn't even tell you. If somebody was to ask me before this, I couldn't even tell you what to look for. About 3 o'clock in the morning, he supposedly passed out, but he was facing up. They said that they saw him vomit all over his mouth. He drowned in his own vomit. Had he been turned around on his side, and I don't blame anybody um, because of a mixture of uh, prescription medication. Uh, my son has been in a coma for a little over three and a half years. In a vegetative state, um, zero to no chance of ever coming back. He lies in a bed 24 hours a day. Uh, He's fed through a tube and a hole in his stomach. He has a trach down his throat. I have to brush his teeth every day. I shave him every other day. Wash his face. The nurses have to come and change him every time he defecates on himself or, or urinates on himself. My son is a 21-year-old baby with, he can't, which he can't do anything for himself. Wow. The only thing he does for himself right now is breathe. Older than baby boomers, they've been prescribed medications through their whole life. They're not afraid of the drug, but say they go in for muscle injury, they start popping the drugs, they think, well, this, the doctor prescribed it one every four hours, but uh, I think maybe two might be better. And they start taking more, they start running out of their meds. You build a tolerance, so now they're running out and they start going to the doc to get more and more. And now they kind of get it. The doc cuts him off because uh, he's, a, he's a drug seeker. He's seeking, trying to get more medication. Then he starts visiting the ERs and making up injuries. And he gets prescribed small amounts or injectables. Now we just stringing this hook guy around and he's starting to become our problem as law enforcement. It's not just the people you see on the streets. It's, uh, I've known a lot of people through work that have asked me for drugs, from uh, construction workers to lawyers to doctors, uh, professionals. There's always a black market. People always selling their prescriptions because people sell their drugs to make money. We've just seen a dramatic increase over the last 10 years in the amount of prescription drugs and the cost for the prescription drugs. In 2002, it was approximately $415,000. And in 2012, it jumped all the way up into $1.765 million, which is a 430% increase in the actual amount that's being billed for prescription drugs for city and county workers' compensation. The longer that somebody's actually being prescribed this medication, the longer that they're going to be out of work, especially with regards to the opioids. You can't just sustain that type of increase without it having some effect on the taxpayer. I'm not a doctor or a medical person, and my staff, we're, we're claims people, insurance people, but we see things. People can, can get really hurt in a car accident, and there are pain issues. What we see at times are narcotics or stimulants, muscle relaxant. They are prescribed so much that 
people become dependent upon it. And even worse, you might treat with two or three different medical providers and they're each prescribing things without knowing what the other and the bill's going to the insurance company and based on the amount of drugs if the person's taking all of that it's not unlikely that they're addicted I guess the other alternative is they could also sell them on the street but you know we don't have any way of knowing that just having a few sessions of physiotherapy and then being resigned to take pain medication for an injury in this day and age in our country is not enough we have to broaden the use of complementary care, which may include chiropractic, acupuncture. We need to extend the ability to have longer physical therapy. We need to introduce psychologists to deal with the mental part of pain treatment. By opening up our treatment pathways, we should see a more cost-effective treatment for chronic pain, less addiction, less death, less overdoses, and less morbidity. As in any profession, I believe that there probably are physicians who have abused the process and were promoting high use of these medications inappropriately. But I think standardly most people believe that the, the common doctor in the United States is doing it appropriately out of and out of compassion. We did a study and prescription opiate-based drugs was one of the highlights of our package, costs of our benefit. And we're talking millions of dollars, um, $43 million. I guess Vicodin was identified as the number one to Oxycontin. And the only other drug that beat it was Viagra. That, I mean, everything else was, you know, way below that. So we did a study and we started, you know, to revisit our um, educational program to, you know, see what we can do and help our membership. And our industry is very, hazardous. If you get hurt, you're not going to scrape your finger, you know, either get maimed or you're going to get killed. And the concern is if you got somebody under the influence of alcohol or any type of mind-altering drugs, you know, it's an unsafe environment. 20 years ago, I don't remember any of this, you know, I don't remember going to training for any of this, but it's come so far now, these, these uh, drugs. It's great. I think more companies are recognizing it and, and taking steps to, uh, to prevent it. When we started to look into it, we found not a lot, but there is a problem. Why has been calling? There's two types of calls. Why is my husband subject to work with somebody high on drugs or under the influence of alcohol? And some are, can you help my husband? Why aren't you guys helping my husband? So we got involved, we called the employers, and we decided to try to do a educational program again. And we have a few cases right now that these guys probably may lose their job because of this. Usually it's meth, but now we're finding out it's other substance and actually it's legal, they get in from the doctors. You know, veterans seem to be having much more behavioral health problems now than we can discern or detect that they did in the Civil War and other wars as well. So the question is why and what's driving that. And there are many factors that are different, but one of the things that we know are different are the prescription medications. What you're seeing now in veterans and in active duty personnel who have come back from their deployment tours who have been diagnosed with PTSD are cocktails of medications. Um, they're, they're given an antidepressant, they're given anti-anxiety medications, sleep medications. Um, there's a high degree of pain medications, opiates that are being used with veterans diagnosed with PTSD. Many of them are in some cases getting even more than one of those categories of medications. So you're seeing young people, often in their early 20s, who are in these cocktails of, of psychotropic medications, 6, 7, 10, 15 at a time. Certainly what my colleagues in the VA describe is the young people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, typically in their early 20s, are being prescribed these large cocktails of, of medications. And we're talking about people whose brains aren't even fully myelinated yet. So what, what is the effect of, of the, this much medication on their brains? We have breakfast, lunch, this is lunch. And then we have dinner. So this is this. She's serving the, the macaroni salad. Like so over 700 meals a day. In the winter months, we have a very large influx of mainland 
homeless folks. They're snowbirds. A lot of those folks tend to be vets. Pretty much any time of the year, it's not unusual that 40% of our single men's dorm would be vets. And many of them um, have a history of legitimate and necessary uh, treatment protocols with opiates and different pain medications. Like everybody else, that becomes a lifestyle. A lot of them tend to be middle-aged and also just like the rest of the homeless population probably all over the country, a very unfortunate but a very definite consistent intersection of trauma and PTSD, substance abuse, and mental illness, and chronic health conditions. Starting to see more of an aged population, uh, more older folks. And we often get people coming in with a whole bag of medications, and many of them folks who are older, but particularly when they're homeless. Does it cause a lot of the substance abuse? Maybe not so much the illegal substance abuse, but you have to really look at some of the prescription medicines that people are carrying around with them. A lot of medications. The VA healthcare providers and the healthcare providers in the, in the Department of Defense do do the best that they can to take care of the people they're charged with caring for. One of the strategies is to use a lot of medications. So the percentage of World War II veterans who have received disability compensation is 11%. That's 50 years after the war. For Vietnam, it was 16%. Right now we have over half the veterans who have returned from Iraq and Afghanistan and been discharged from the military. Over a year ago, 46% had applied for disability already. Now that number is well over 50%. So fast forward 50 years from now and think about where our current generation of veterans are going to be with regard to, to disability. I've known quite a few elderly people who actually sell their pain medication to supplement their income. It's unfortunate, but it's... Uh... It is what it is. One of the critical issues today in, in this uh, elderly population is the polypharmacy. Many times, because of their age and perhaps early dementia, they forget what they're taking, why they're taking it, or even how to take it. Unfortunately, many elderly people end up in an addictive state, not because they're devious or criminal, but because they fall into an innocent trap of forgetting and becoming a victim of polypharmacy. The scope of the prescription drug problem is massive, complex, and its effects are like a viral epidemic. For this reason, the President has requested $25.5 billion toward reducing drug use and its consequences. And much of this is intended to educate, not incarcerate, to prevent, not prosecute. Emergency room visits for prescription drug misuse more than doubled between 2004 and 2011 and have almost doubled again. Americans are dying in record numbers. Fear of uh, being arrested is, is the least of your, uh, your issues. You're gonna get what you have to get, you know, because physically and psychologically, you're hurting, you're in pain. I ended up in the hospital, taken there by the ambulance three times before I came in. I got arrested this last time. It'll do what you have to do on the school of drugs. Don't even think you can handle it. Because guess what? Because you cannot handle it. Believe it, in the end, it always takes control. Whether it's with the media, whether it's through uh, educational tools, we've got to tell people that your medicine cabinet is going to be a prime source for your teenage kids to experiment. And, and often, uh, when people get prescriptions, when they don't have the pain anymore, they let it sit in their medicine cabinet. They need to dispose of those properly. Prescription drug abuse has become a major problem on the mainland and we're starting to see it now in treatment. We know it's a problem on the streets, we know it's a problem in the schools. We're seeing from the ages 12 to 18 kids are raiding their parents in medicine cabinet and now we're finding that it's being sold on the street in volumes which means you have to have a large number of people seeking for it. And so when the students say it's not enough anymore what's in the medicine cabinet they go right to the streets and they start buying it. And now kids at the school are selling it. The opioid pain medication is almost doubling every year and that's really causing us alarm. On the adult side the ebb and flow of opioid medication on the streets starts not being available 
people are moving over to heroin. And all of a sudden, we're seeing this huge uptick in heroin use here in Hawaii, when for a number of years, Hawaii has been very low, and now it's really increasing again. And heroin is probably one of the most difficult to treat. It was a lot cheaper. It's always there than for searching for the opiates. Never in a million years did I, when I was growing up, heroin was the worst drug in the world. I, I was, there's never, ever, any way in, in this world or lifetime that I would see myself sticking a needle in my arm. Um, but it was like that. It was that quick. It was that easy. Recently, the media has chronicled a resurgence of heroin abuse in the United States and actually more heroin being moved into the country. The DEA's heroin signature program determined that 90% of wholesale heroin seizures were able to be traced from Mexico or South America. DEA also reports that the Mexican-based Sinaloa drug cartel is expanding its market eastward and producing and selling heroin that is more pure. Between 2008 and 2013, Heroin seizures along the southwest border increased nearly fourfold. According to a 2012 national survey, 666,000 Americans reported using heroin during the previous year. That number has steadily grown over the past several years. So this begs the question, why are more people using heroin? Individuals who used prescription pain relievers for non-medical purposes were 19 times more likely to use heroin in the past year than those who had not. That's an amazing thing to me. Over the last 60 years, the pharmaceutical industry has exploded. There are many more drugs on the market. They're being mass produced. And people have become accustomed to taking drugs or looking to drugs as their first go-to um, point when they have an ailment. That has become a cultural baseline for how we confront our physical and mental problems. Call your doctor if your depression worsens or you have unusual changes in behavior or thoughts of suicide. Antidepressants can increase these in children, teens, and young adults. Elderly dementia patients you feel lonely and don't enjoy the things you once loved. Things just don't feel like they used to. These are some symptoms of depression, a serious medical condition affecting over 20 million Americans. Sleepless nights yield to restful sleep. Don't drive or operate machinery until you feel fully awake, walking, eating, driving, or engaging in other activities while asleep without remembering it the next day have been reported. The American pharmaceutical industry has effectively gained a certain kind of monopoly status in terms of being able to provide drugs on a global scale. One of the problems, though, that is attached to this is that countries that can't afford the prices have devised alternatives, sometimes very sketchy alternatives, where they'll be cheaper. And because they're cheaper, many Americans are also going to turn to those outside sources. But this counterfeit pharmaceutical industry, where the dangers associated with counterfeiting are very serious. So many people turning to the black market for sources of drugs that they had originally got on prescription. Sales by rogue internet pharmacies that do not require valid medical prescriptions are often conduits for counterfeit drugs. They pose as an ever-increasing threat to our community, the nation, and to our planet's public health. We don't know enough about the risk of addiction among people that have chronic pain. So there's basic research on that area. But in parallel, we're developing medications to treat pain effectively that are not addictive. Signaling to people that they shouldn't be afraid to call 911 is a, is a significant uh, advancement in how we're going to reduce overdose deaths. So a good Samaritan law would really help here. Uh, absolutely. Prescription monitoring program should work. If I can order from Google and get things immediately, immediately, why can we not have a system like that that is interoperational, that I can have information from one state to the other? 
How many tons do you think were collected just last April in one day in the United States of America of prescription drugs? Maybe you're thinking 10 tons, 20, 390 tons of prescription drugs were collected in a day in April uh, just this last um, month. And so that's what we're dealing with when we talk about the problem. I think we've become a society that has very low distress tolerance. Somebody has a symptom and we need to find a quick fix for it. Somebody is uncomfortable, we, we rush in with um, all kinds of, of ways of changing things for them. Somebody's unemployed, we have a safety net. You know, somebody's having symptoms, we have a medication. It's a difficult conversation when you have identified someone who is starting to use medication beyond what is safe that may be moving into that range where you are concerned about addiction. And yet it's the most important conversation we're ever going to have with that patient. We know that there's an epidemic across the United States. We know it's coming to our shores. If we don't act, it will only get worse. We know prescription drugs, especially opiates, lead to worse things, whether it's crystal methamphetamine or even heroin. We can develop the resources and the capacity to cope with life's difficulties without so many pharmaceuticals if we make this a priority with human caring, advanced physical therapies, and innovative solutions to relieve the pain and suffering of body and mind. We need not steal away so many lives. I would like to say to people out there that you're not alone. You know, this happens to a lot of people. You can do it. You can get clean and sober and you can have a good life. Be very supportive. Don't ever give up on your kids. Hang in there with them. Don't enable them, but do support them. Finally, the light bulb went on and I said, oh gosh, you know, you gotta, you gotta get a grip of this. You gotta get a grip of this, you know. And it was rough, but I'm here today. <laughs> I had come to the conclusion that it was okay for me to be a drug addict. I would accepted the fact that this is how my life is gonna be. You have to know that there is a way out. The life that you can have is unbelievably awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm living proof, I'm living proof.